Welcome to The Robust Marketer. Today, I'm extremely lucky to have Jeremy Shoe Money Shoemaker. Now, there are several stratas of affiliate marketer. Uh, I've been in this industry for about 10 years, and when I first came into it, already the person occupying the top strata of that space was Shoe Money. Uh, read his blog on the regular. You actually were, I don't know if you remember this, but it was you, me, and Samantha Brackett on my very first ever uh, affiliate summit West, and, and we were out, out for some drinks. So you're, you're intimately tied with my, uh, my marketer's hero, hero's journey um, from back in the day. And since then, he's gone on to multiple other kinds of affiliate marketing success, uh, from SEO to email. Um, he's built companies, he's sold companies, he's built offices, he's downsized offices, he's come full circle more times than most people have even started the circle. Uh, welcome to the Robust Marketer, Jeremy. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure. Thanks for the intro. That was super nice of you. Um, speaking of Samantha, I just ran into her. Did you? And really? I haven't seen... Mm -hmm. She... Um, you know, in Canada, they give you like forever off work if you have a kid. Of course. And so, you know, she got out of Never Blue and all that stuff. But anyway, so she's back in the industry and she Global works for wire. some other company. Yeah, she yeah, works for so. Revenue Wire in Victoria now here. So she's, yeah. uh, and it's funny actually, I'm doing, uh, I just hired, I'm doing with iStack training now, we're building up iStack's like Victoria presence and we're just picking off old uh, Never Blue alumni. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's great. Um, so yeah, so I wanted so we always start this podcast by talking about the marketer's hero's journey. Like what what sort of brought you to where you are today? I'm sure a lot of people are aware of your story, um, what, you know, as it relates to the famous check and uh, and some of the other things. But if you can just give me a quick synopsis of of where of of how you got where you are today, I think it would be a good jumping off point for people who maybe aren't familiar, but I bet most are. Yeah, no worries. Um... And I always perfect this, or uh, I should say improve on this, yeah. um, is basically I started 2000, it would have been a little bit before 9-11, and um, I created a website that was in the mobile space, and it developed, it was basically around ringtones, you could upload whatever audio format you had, and or MP3, and then tell what kind of phone you had. And it would convert it and spit you back the right file. It was all free, whatever. And it got to the point where it was getting like 100,000 plus users a day. And then, you know, just one day I got a call from Google AdSense and they said, hey, we've got this product called AdSense and we have a lot of advertisers in the mobile space and not a lot of mobile um, focused websites. And she actually walked me through pasting the code and... um and then, yeah, and then the result you see is the the famous check. Funny story about the check, I never showed that to anyone until like 2007. Um, and it was it was because somebody leaked it. Like I would share it with people online and stuff, some people I didn't know very well. And then someone posted it on, it was a not even a well-known blog. And then everyone was like, it's fake, it's fake. And... And then Google actually was like, no, that's actually – and then they did this case study on me and I, I was – so I was on unemployment, by the way, um, okay. when I got that check. And so I went to the bank with a $300 unemployment check and $132,000 check from Google. Um, so then from there, I basically – had you know i was using adsense but you know adsense has restrictions on what you can um what advertisers can put in their ads so i was like you know what'd be cool is i can see like what these people are advertising on my site and obviously it must be working well for them which was like ringtone offers and mobile offers so i was like let me make my own ad system and go directly use my affiliate link so i created this thing called shoe money ads um which then um we had, I met, I was playing poker at like, I don't know what time it was, at Binion's in Las Vegas and just happened to be um, the eBay affiliate team there. And they were like, oh, somebody's using your shoe money ads to drive, you know, leads to eBay. You know, like you ever think about making an advertising network around eBay and me being a developer and I had another uh, partner that was, well, he was like a 20 on our programmer, but he was always kind of integral in my company. And, um, so we we basically just took the code from that, created auction ads. eBay gave us you know special access and high price, and 
moved along and I still had all the, the next pimp stuff, which was the ringtone site going and it was crushing affiliate offers. I mean, it was printing money and yeah, I mean, it was doing three to 5,000 a day in profit, um, all day between now, this was a lot of different, I, I implemented subscription revenue. I implemented, you know, obviously I had AdSense contextual revenue, um, my own affiliate revenue. I mean, just like I had really honed it in and I sold physical products as well. Um, which was totally out of my hands. Like I left someone in charge of it and cause it was pretty basic. Like, and I marked up the physical products, like, like I would get cables from five cents from China. I would sell them for $30, you know? So it was, uh, it was just, it was just, I mean, printing money. So I had money to invest and this is back in the days before cloud stuff. So I spent, I mean, just my load balancers were, Coyote load balancers were like 75 grand a piece. And then I had all this hardware. Anyway, so auction ads created it. Four months later, sold it for millions. Um, And then from there, I built Shoe Money Tools, subscription platform, um, which would basically let you do all this research on SEO and just a bunch of really cool tools, not only on SEO, but just like, um, we had a direct like AdWords campaign builder that would actually let you like would upload right into your AdWords account. Okay. Um, and then it would actually keep track and it would automatically withdraw, you know, ones that weren't working and all this other stuff before all this other software came out. And then, um, I don't know, I created free SEO report, which I sold. Um, I just a lot of stuff in between. Yeah. Um, and then somebody came to me and was like, you should make an info product on how to make money online. So I did that. I made money, but then I kind of got into that world, like promoting these other people's and I did about a million in commissions in a year. And, but it was, you know, then I got kind of in that world where then it was like issue money, a scam, read this review stuff. So not my most proudest moment, but. Yeah, um, that's an interest. It's an it's a space that we're in now too. That the, the info product space, and it's like I think there's a line that you need to that that we're walking anyways. That we feel we need to walk in that where, uh, yeah, the, the making money systems versus the train the skills based training. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I, I that's an interesting thing that you found yourself in in that space, and and that you and that you didn't love it. You didn't love what what it what, what your brand was kind of becoming in that space. Is that accurate? Yeah, for sure. I mean, my girlfriend. Um, her ex-husband, for instance, uh, is like, yeah, you know, your boyfriend's a scammer. Like, just read this, you know, and it talks about – I mean, people talk shit about me before this. I don't care. Whatever, gonna happen. you know. Yeah, I mean, like, I think – I mean, I used to engage – when I had the blog, and the blog was a good source of revenue as well. I mean, it still is. Um, it doesn't have – a. T- I mean, it's like 10% of the readership that it had, you know, back then because it was – I mean, I would just talk smack about everyone, yeah. you know, and and then I got to know them by going to conferences and stuff, and it it evolved, right? Like I started to build like real businesses, and so I had some some bigger companies that you know I had like downtown. I mean, this is fast forwarding a lot, but you know, in downtown Nebraska here in Lincoln, I had like with the PAR program, my email platform, I had like 30 employees, and we were managing email for like some very, very large brands. Mm -hmm. Um, We had less than, like I want to say about 15 clients and we were doing over 10 million a year in revenue. So um, yeah, I sold that company to our biggest um, client and then I hooked up pretty much everyone that was of value there um, for good jobs and then got rid of my office, was like, I'm done. I'll never have an employee again. And so that's where I'm at. So now I build, you know, still software as a service applications and, you know, still leverage what I learned from affiliate stuff, what I learned from other stuff, um, you know, and just, just, uh, you know, it just gives me a leg up and, you know, yeah. Yeah. And you're le- I was listening to a, to a podcast you did, I guess in 2015 and you were talking about this process of building this legit you know, company with this big downtown office and this huge overhead where you're burning, you're saying 15K a day, you know, minimum on staff and rent, or that was 15K a day, maybe, or 15K a month for rent, basically. Uh, but you're just, you're just having, you know, this big overhead business and you you found yourself stressing out, found, found yourself not liking managing people. 
uh, and 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 that, what was that experience like for you? Like, how long were you in that world where you were sort of being something that you weren't, or or were sort of forced to be into something that you weren't? Yeah, that's that's actually perfect. I always thought like I needed to be a CEO of a big company, and you know, like build and, an and empire very, or build a yeah, you know, yeah. And there's only – I don't know that there's been many people that evolved from affiliate to CEO. Yeah. Um, like Jason Akatif who owned to mind. Ads for Doe, who owned his own network, was an affiliate. But then really for the network, I mean he's become a, a great CEO. And the stuff he's doing now is amazing even outside the affiliate space. Um, but really like there's no like just that was affiliates that – anyway, so – I think I've been the exception a little bit in that I've built, you know, several SaaS based companies and, you know, anyway, so yeah, like waking up and knowing you have to make $7,000 in a day just to break even yeah, sucks. Yeah. And so in that company, like, I think part of like being a lone wolf affiliate marketer for so long you are used to doing everything yourself. Like you're, especially if you're like the most, like the most successful affiliates I knew either were developers themselves and could do everything, like could do graphics, development, copy. Um, that was me, you know? Um, and then like, you've got like Nikki Cakes and Charles No, yeah. And like Charles is more of like, he can work with, he's one that's actually built a really good business, even though it's, he kind of like teaches you how to make money with Facebook stuff and, and stuff like that. So it's kind of still in the same space. But anyway, so yeah, for me, it was just, I tried to be something I wasn't. And like I said, used to being a lone wolf is that like I had four programmers, but yet I wrote 75% of the code. <laughs> um, I had three salespeople, but I did all the sales. I don't, I don't know if they ever made one sale. Um, I had an administrative team and an accountant, uh, an in-house accountant that wasn't cheap, that was just keeping up on it. Because, I mean, when you've got that many employees and you've got all this stuff, you've got, you know, your payroll and benefits or whatever. All the, yeah, the 401k program and, yeah. you know, freaking maternity policies. Yeah. Like, Imagine Canada. Like, <laughs> I don't even, yeah. I mean, like, you know, like they would come to me like, okay, here's the different things we can do with maturing. And I'm like, just fucking pick one. Yeah. Like, I don't, yeah. like, I, I don't, it's not like yes or no. It's just, just pick one. Yeah. You know, like, I don't, I don't care. Like, I'm here to, you know, you guys realize that if I don't make money, none of this stuff matters. Yeah. So, and it's, like, the, it's the number of decisions. This is something that the CEO and founder of GoToMobi, uh, when I was working there, talked to me about. He was just like, he's like, do you realize how many decisions I have to make in a day? Like, and it's just, and it's, and it is, it's decisions about maternity policies. Yeah, all these decisions have to be made, whether you really want to make them or not, whether you even really care about them or not. And they can, they end up defining your company. So as someone in that CEO position, especially with 30 reports, you're just having to make decisions all day and, and, and less like, you know, rolling your sleeves up and getting things done. And I, it sounds like you had, you, you were caught in this, like still trying to do shit yourself and still trying to grow this team. And it sounded like a unpleasant situation. Yeah, it was bad. And then, um, I, I, I should say not from a monetary perspective yeah. because we had such big clients, but I didn't make, even though the revenue growth, gross revenue was huge. I didn't really make that much money from it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it was, I didn't lose money. So yeah. Okay. It sounds cool. like you haven't lost money in like any of your ventures, which is always a good, which is a good feather to have in your cap. Or it sounds like, it sounds like most of the things you've done one way or the other have ended up being a success. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. I mean like there's some things that I gamble with because I have money coming from other areas. So like, like for instance, when I started the advertising network and I went with eBay's you know, suggestion and I started auction ads when I sold it, it was probably 300 grand under, but okay. it sold for millions. And plus they gave me all the money back for all the hardware and all that. Nice. I, I didn't, ex I mean, my goal for that was user growth. It wasn't profitability. So I expected to lose a lot of money before I made money because I knew once we had the publisher base and everyone was using it, then we could just flip a switch a little bit and, you know, we were paying out people more than we were getting paid. Yeah. Just um, tweak the breakage dial. Like, <laughs> right. 
and 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 also like if you referred someone you got like a good percentage of what they made and stuff and we were paying out 100 percent of what ebay gave us so our goal was just to get so many people to wear and when i say tweak the dial i mean like going to ebay and saying like we need more money and yeah. even getting like 50 cents from them when you've got when you're doing i think we did three million in revenue the last month i sold it it's a big difference yeah. so then we would have been profitable so you know it's always like my whole mantra of like things that have been very successful for me has always been like like look for something that doesn't like i really want something that doesn't exist and then i build it and offer it to other people and then the money's just a side effect always so um like i wish like i could tell people like i had this grand scheme of selling companies or you know, having them be super profitable and all this. But I, I mean, like, it's simple to me. Yeah. Like if, if people find something of value, it's the same way I feel about SEO. Like I used to wear shirts that said SEO is bullshit, you know, to SEO conferences. And it was just, I was just like, just build something people want to link to. And then it will stand the test of time. Yeah. Like just, just build something of value. And don't get me wrong. I gamed the crap out of it back in the day oh, and I sure. made a lot of money making the MFAs. I don't know. Some of your people might be, might not remember the, what we call the spam and jam days or MFA sites made for AdSense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And now there's huge, and I've been a part of some huge arbitrage plays, yeah. um, with working with celebrities, you know, oh, really? doing, and that's, that's been really interesting. Um, can you name drop? Yeah, for sure. So I did a cons page. Okay. Um, a person came to me that basically, so if you go to Akon's fan, um, fan page, okay, you'll you'll see like he'll drop news stories like twice a day that go to a page called Akon Connected. That's not his page, mm. okay. So basically, you pay him a licensing fee, or not him, but someone there a Manager licensing fee whatever, yeah. of it was six figures a month, and then what you do is, is basically from that site, you then run like ads, AdSense actually paid the best on the new, his new site. And you would just arbitrage that. So, I mean, you would get like 600,000 to a million clicks. I mean, he's got 52 million fans. Yeah. So between, you know, his own people and other people, you would see a ton of clicks. And then I just got more, me and the people that did it, like I wanted to take it to the next because there were so many forms of monetization they were missing out on. And anyway, so long story short, like I was just like, eh, you know, I mean, it's 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 out there. I mean, the the funny thing is like none of these cele these celebrities will let you post. I mean, it's it's so inexpensive to license these, and there's so much fit. And that's actually one of the reasons why Facebook um, throttled the amount of content that links outside of Facebook. Okay. Because you can go to, I mean, there's, there's any, I mean, almost any page that has more than like, shoot, there was like little Disney people that had like 600,000 fans that you could do for like 20 grand a month. And just by arbitraging and making a news post and it was like their site, but it wasn't. And slammed with I mean, ads they, basically. Yeah, just yeah. totally, totally slammed with ads and, yeah. and the whole the whole sliders, you know, the of the whole sliders of like, you know, ten things you didn't know about yeah. X and ten celebrities you know, and with three tits. Like, for sure, for sure. <laughs> I wanna know. And and then it was just like click the next one, click the next one. Well those are page reloads, you know, and those are more RPMs. Mm -hmm. So it's um it's it honestly was like the Wild West and then Facebook caught on to it. Yeah. And it still is, though. I mean, those, those sites are still – and now most of them that are big, they're actually managed by a lot of – so a lot of the bigger ones, now management companies have reached out to them to charge a CP, like a – you know, a, gosh, what would it be? It's a CP whatever. Basically, it boils down to um, cost per thousand clicks. Okay. So, you know, and then they just they just will – they have advertisers that will – 
pay that, you yeah, know, or yeah. people that arbitrage that will pay that. So, but it's still people, fairly early days with affi- with influencer marketing, right? Like that, that's it's good that they're, they're that they're wising up to this performance, these performance metrics, and actually charging for clicks. Like, do you, what, what do you? Because I, I know you've dabbled in influencer marketing. I read the I read the TechCrunch article actually about you beating Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg in uh, the Fast Company influencer contest. Uh, what like what what do you, what's your stance on on like influencer marketing sort of generally now? And talk a little bit about that that contest that sort of showed uh, the power of performance marketing. Yeah, it was. I mean, that part was easy. I mean, honestly, like I was. I mean, like they wanted Britney Spears or Shaquille O'Neal or you know Bill Gates or Ashton Kutcher to win. You know, they yes. didn't want no, affiliate no. marker or Jeremy Shoemaker to win. So, I mean, for me, it was an easy sale. I I emailed out to my list. And I said, hey, you know, Fast Companies had has this thing where if you sign up for this thing, then they will guarantee that they'll put you in the magazine. It could be a small pixel, but your picture will be in the magazine. And so I was like, do you realize this is a huge thing for you? Because you could say as seen in Fast Company magazine. And so that was that's it. Well, then when they signed up, like it was like everyone under them and everyone under them. And then, so I won and actually like the top 10, I think were pretty much all affiliate marketers or, I mean, the funny thing is like a lot of them were under me. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, um, an interesting thing. And there was, there's that one guy, Pace Latin, who's a total dirt bag who like, wrote the reporter and said that I was a big scammer and all this stuff. And then they reached out to me and I, an- I answered and I said, look, look at this guy's thing. Like he's, he hasn't paid child support forever. He's got like, I, I think someone can look it up, assault and battery to where he beat his wife. And I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. So someone, okay. so I, I know he's got some stuff. And I was just like, are you seriously, seriously going to take – because he, he's just – he's one of those affiliate marketers. And you used to see it a lot, but you don't anymore um, to where you would have affiliate marketers that had fallen from grace per se. And then they would just hate on anyone that was successful. Yeah. yeah. So unfortunately that happens. And you know, I would meet these people and I would just be like – you know, and they would, they would actually like kind of open up about it. And just be like, you know, I just got so frustrated and I'm really sorry about what I said. And I was like, dude, I, I get it. You know, I mean, I, when you reach enough people, it's just the law of averages that you're going to reach people. The only one time, and I made a video about this one time, somebody threatened my children and, um, I had that person track down and then I made a video about him and it was just some guy who owned a tile shop and just like tried to do stuff and lost like two grand because he was an idiot and then blamed me for it and just was one of those guys who let stuff fly and wow i don't know yeah just... i had a <clears throat> a private investigator pay him a visit and um yeah i just tracked him down and that sounds you know. like a good precedent to set in a way right like there's there's internet jawing and there's there's shit talking and stuff like that but you get into the the realm where you're talking about children a knowing you have children b threatening them that seems like a good precedent to set that you get a visit from a, a private investor yeah. if you talk about my fucking kids. Yeah, and I mean, you know? you know, it was I normally don't talk about my kids, but one of my kids was born with um meningitis and um scary. it was like one of those where they gave her her last rites and it was like you have pretty much 48 hours before she'll die. And and then so I posted about that and just like I was just like, you know, cuz I'm not a religious person. But I was like, you know, those that are and you think it'll help, like I could use it. And and um, so it was that post that the person said, I hope your kids die of cancer. So <laughs> now two days later, they came in, pulled all her tubes and said, we read the chart wrong and said and that was it. I mean, like, she's totally fine, you know, like and it took me like oh, like years, honestly, to believe that she was totally fine. Um so anyway, um, but I believe in like punching people like square in the nose if they come to you. Like you, you have to defend yourself. So like if you just Google like shoe money sues, I mean I've there's been people that have used my check picture to sell their shitty products. Okay. And I don't care if somebody wants to use it and talk shit about me. Like okay, 
but if you use it and you say it's my product and you do that, um, I caught one. Well, I, I can't talk about a couple of them because the settlements, but um, you know, there's 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 a Google thing where you can if you search for it, you'll find it. And I really wanted to take that one to the house, like all the way legally, because it would have been an epic, epic precedent of, I think it would have been the Roe versus Wade of digital advertising. Crazy. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the claim is out there. I mean, it's, you know, it's public. Anyone who wants to, there was like five tech crunch stories about it. It was in the wall street journal. Um, I could not believe, I couldn't believe it, um, you know, when we came to a settlement with the parties involved. And and they said I, something libelous, essentially? Or they... No, this was, um, so this was a Google employee. Oh, I did read and, about this. I did read about this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she, yeah, they, they used your your brand. It's weird that Google, that someone from Google was using your brand. Yeah, I can't talk too much okay. or confirm or deny. Okay. I mean, the things the things are out there. Yeah. Um, you know, we we made a settlement that I'm very happy with. I mean, to the point of where I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm very happy with the amount or no, well, the way things came out. But I wish I would have found an attorney that would have worked with me on that because it would have cost me millions, you know, to to take that against Google. I mean, you know. Um, and I don't even know if that would have been enough, you know? So, hmm. yeah. So, really interesting. um, but yeah, I've had, I've had several, I mean, I've had, I've even gone after someone on eBay that was using my image and saying it was me, you know, and I went after that guy and I, I think I got like, like 2,500 bucks out of him. I mean, like I just go, I mean, like if you're going to sell shit and use my picture and say, it's you, yeah. I'm coming, I'm coming for you. And I have every time and I've had 14 cases wow. and I mean, that's bullshit. I've worked very hard to get where I'm at. And if you're going to, you know, lie and say it's that and sell shitty products, then I'm coming for you. So let it be known, internet world. Don't fuck with shoe money. Well, it's like, you know, when people say I'm a bully, like, oh, this guy didn't have any money, whatever. No, he made a choice. If he broke the law, he's going to jail, you know, so I just took it in his civil matter. So, you know, it doesn't matter what, if you do sketchy shit like that, then I'm not a bully. I'm just, I'm just protect, you know what? I'm coming for you. Like you started this shit. So I get it. Whatever. Yeah. I know. I'm not a bully. I'm not whatever. Just don't use my, my image or picture and say that it's my product. Yeah. Like, you know, if you want to reach out, if you want to send me a copy of it and have me do a testimonial, I've done that for so many, so many people, so much stuff, you know, like that's fine. You know, but if you're going to say anyway, so whatever. To, to, like... to jump topics a little bit here. So one of the things, uh, you know, it feels like you, you're, you've are you undergone a massive transformation over the past year, basically. You've had a massive, massive physical transformation. How much weight did you lose? Um, About 40 pounds. 40 and, pounds. Yeah, in, in a very short amount of time. Uh, I lost most of it. But part of that was initially filing for divorce and the way you kind of lose your appetite um so there was that and then i didn't eat for like there was like three days i didn't eat a thing and but then anyway so i just instead of like being i mean there's two ways you can go right with that you can either get fat and feel sorry for yourself or you can just get just like i don't know f it yeah and i don't know how much you can swear in here but basically yeah so i was just like fuck it you know get your fucking ass together and get after it and so i need to put on muscle because i've just gone way too much into you know into cardio training and stuff like that where i've lost so much weight to where i mean it's um yeah it's it's to the point where i do i mean just like i do 100 push-ups every day you know i do 100 sit-ups every day just in the days i'm not you know but i haven't like gone to the a gym gym and lifted so um I did that like 10 years ago and I got pretty big, but I wasn't, I didn't eat right and I wasn't in shape and I will go on things where I don't eat right, but you know, I burn enough calories doing other stuff. So one, one of the things that I was really curious about was specifically around your divorce because you've been pretty public about it. You've, you've talked about it. You talk about it on Facebook a little bit 
And, uh, you know, I was listening to this last podcast. You were talking about the forbidden list. You, you know, I'm, I'm married. I have, I have this sort of forbidden list as well. I'm wondering what it's like with someone with your resources at this point when you don't have a forbidden list at this point. If you're, if you're sort of out of the marriage, are you, are you finding – do you have an immense sense of freedom? Is, is the grass sort of greener like you may have thought it was? Or what's, what's your mindset about that right now? So it's two things, really. Um, I mean – so me and my ex-wife had always had this thing where I was the cowboy and she was the rock, you know, and so the cowboy would have successes that would build over time and, you know, the rock would – she was – you know, I paid for her medical school, all of her other stuff. I paid for our house with cash, like everything and, you know, and so like I doubled the size of our house when I sold one company, you know, like just – I don't – I'm actually kind of frugal in a bit with cash, um, which, you know, when you give up a lot of that and a divorce kind of blows ass. But, um, you know, so, yeah, as far as the freedom goes, like I was super devastated at first. Okay. And in our – And you have kids, my wife, which is a, a my, huge deal. But I have to say, like, our kids were better than we were. Um, Amazing. I got them, I did a lot of research on how not to fuck up your kids through a divorce. And especially at the ages they are, they're kind of like a sponge, you know. And, Which age? Approximately. Uh, they're 9-11. 9-11. Okay. So, so I did all this research on how not to fuck up your kids. And one of the biggest things was to get them their own therapist, one that specializes in this. And so um, – it, the problem is, is there's very few of them and they're booked up a lot, but I got into one of them. She's the best. And it was all the difference in the world. Hmm. And she, she said to me, she said, um, you know, like, I, I don't care if it's the shittiest divorce ever. I don't care if it's the best divorce ever. Like I've worked with kids. It'll be fine. You know, um, I'm not going to ever tell you anything that they just closed to me because I have to earn their trust. You know, she's like, you know, but from a high level, you know, I, I'll give you guys advice on stuff. So she was amazing. And, you know, with that, but as far as like the initial part of the divorce, I was like, I didn't use a computer or I deleted Facebook. I deleted Gmail for like two months. I was just like, I was completely devastated. Oh, like, terrible. Oh, it was bad. Like, I mean, the night that we decided to separate and do all this stuff, like, I got into her iCloud and I saw messages that, I mean, this was all posted on Facebook. This yeah. is all public stuff. Um, I posted the entire story because she started telling stories to people and I was like, okay, let's tell the whole story. And so like I saw some stuff that basically drove me to a dark place and I don't even remember what happened, but I know I, I fractured my, my right leg. I had a hairline fracture. My knuckles were completely fucked. And, um, I ended up in the nut house for two days, which was very interesting. Yeah. Um, so really like that kind of like mentally like stripped me down and was one of the, I have to say like one of the best things that ever happened to me was like being in the nut house with people who are actually trying to commit suicide yeah. and talking with these, because at first I got there and I'm like, Oh my God, these people are going to drive me crazy. Cause they give you like five minutes to write down, you get to write down three contacts, which you get 15 minutes a day to talk on the phone. And then they give you a plastic spoon and a Bible. And that's it. They take all your clothes. And yeah, it was a good time. And, but and, like, you talk about being stripped to your core element. So that's like, that's, that's got to be a crazy experience to rebound from and rebuild from. Yeah. So I got out, I sold, you know, like we, I was still like really dedicated to saving the marriage. And so I sold every computer in the house. I, everything, I was just like, what, what do you want me to do? You know? And, um, and then it just, and then I was just like, I started to realize like, fuck this. And, um, I filed for divorce and for a while, you know, I was like, man, did I do the right thing? You know, blah, blah, blah. And I was a freaking, ugh, it was, it's, it's a, mind fuck for me it was just like you know it was just like i got two kids who's gonna want me well i found out i did okay so yeah you know. like what's what's life like now like what is do do you find yourself like you know are, are you do you feel uh, like more fulfilled at this point do you feel like it's been for the better is it still in the real oh, God. phase yeah i mean like okay so you have to remember when i met my ex-wife i was 450 pounds 
she was the first girlfriend I had in my entire life. Yeah. I was a virgin when I met her at 27. Okay. So she was the only person I had known. And, you know, looking back on that, I'll forever be grateful, you know, for I'd be dead if it wasn't for her because, you know, she was in like had just I don't know where she was at in medical school at that time, but knew a bariatric surgeon that did a procedure that um, they don't even do anymore because it's the mortality rate is very high, uh, but it works. And so it's like um, a lot, a lot band type thing. Is that what you're talking about? Or? No, it's, it's, well, they do now they do gastric bypasses and lap bands, but you know, those, if you look at the statistics, people regain their weight in no do time. They? Um, so I had a duodenal switch, which has a much higher rate of success, but a decent amount of people die during it. So, but at that, I mean, I was on oxygen and a CPAP machine every night to sleep. Wow. I had bad diabetes to where it was spilling into my urine, which is, you know, I had protein spilling in my urine. <laughs> I know that's just gross, but um, that's how bad it was. So I go through this, get married, you know, all this stuff, go through all this stuff. And um, actually in our divorce settlement, there's a clause where I can't say – talk negatively about her um so i mean it, it's only me that would get that like you know i mean and, and there's there's actually a complete section in my divorce decree that deals with social media and how i can't say anything on social media God. so maybe for bad. the best maybe for the best you, ha you have to have a relationship with this person forever still right because they're they're the mother of your kid you got used to talk to her once a week still or more like right but she knows like how transparent I am about yeah. things. And like, I mean, all you have to do is look at my book and my book is extremely transparent about a lot of things. People are like, Oh my, I cannot believe that dude. I can't believe you said that. Um, but like the best thing, like rebuild, like I said, like rebuild, like there was things I never, like I was abused as a child. I never dealt with mm -hmm. that. And it had given me a lot of negative self beliefs. Like, um, just a lot of stuff. And, you know, I saw a trauma therapist that dealt with that. And it was like, like over time, like just helped me realize stuff. And, you know, and she, she kind of put a lot of like, not thoughts, but questions, you know, of more like, you know, were you ever actually in love, like love, love with, you know, your ex or, or was it just because she was the first girl and she showed you this and, mm. you know, and then you, um, her words, not mine, uh, let you walk all over you and blah, blah, blah. So um, I, it just took a lot of deep, deep – like I said, I didn't have a computer, nothing. I had to like figure out me. So like I have a shoe money ring. You know, that's um, – it's gold and it's got my logo and all this cool stuff. Um, I haven't worn it like since the divorce, okay? <laughs> and actually I haven't worn it since the nut house, okay? okay. Um, I probably shouldn't call it the nut house, but it was because I realized in there like – I kind of like had this epiphany of like, what have I become? Like I've become shoe money and not Jeremy Shoemaker. I've lost like myself a little bit in the process of all this. And so I was like, you know, I just, I didn't need a constant reminder of how awesome I was. Mm. And so I used to have around me in my office, like all these articles and things that were actually, I do still have the fast company thing. Oh, over good. Here. Yeah. I do still have that on my wall, nice. but I used to have like a shrine to me. And it was just like, I don't know if it was bad or whatever, but I just was like, okay, you need to get back where you started and made the most money of just like, you know, just like, I don't need a constant reminder of what I've done. I need a constant reminder of where I'm at. And, you know, right now I'm building a company, you know, I'm, I'm doing, it's doing good. It's cash flowing and it's not making a ton of money, you know, but it's just, it's got a, you know, I'm a long-term player in it. And, you know, it's just a lot to that. So the freedom aspect of it is amazing because you can, I've found, I mean, I dated for a while, had a lot of fun. Um, and then I met a girl who was actually everything that I wanted, who I could be completely open and honest with about everything, hmm. who there was a lot of, anyway, there was, there's just, it's just complete, like you can find the one that you want and i have no interest in getting married and she's well aware of that um 
but you know like i love her she's great and you know like i it's just it's really good because you can actually take your time i wasn't you know like after i'd gone on dates and realized like there would be girls interested um i went on a bit of a spree you could say um as you do i imagine that's yeah yeah and i still i still didn't own a computer okay like no computers so this was not no email uh, some some Tinder. on my phone on yeah. my phone you know <laughs> okay, okay. but but Tinder didn't work for me like okay. I don't think it works for people in their and I mean I'm forty I was forty two forty three yeah. now but I don't think it's a good especially in Lincoln Nebraska like if I lived in L A maybe you yeah. know to find some chick to go hook up with but <laughs> you know so I went on a bit of a spree um safely but um. Did you get and your nipples I, pierced? I saw that post. I, we, I, I, inquiring minds from STM I didn't. want to know if you got your nipples pierced. I didn't <laughs> you know. I I had them pierced when I was like 24. Oh, really? And it was actually – I loved it. And and I was talking to my girlfriend and she's, she's amazing and open-minded and just smart as shit. Yeah. And she's an executive assistant to a Fortune 500 company CEO. Cool. So she's so fucking organized yeah. and – like really compliments me so well. And she already helps me before to where with my ex, she's, you know, an anesthesiologist. So she's like, you know, she's, her work schedule is insane. And then it's hard. It was for her to, for anyone to let go of that and come home and not be like, Hey, you know, stat, you know, cause she's, that's what she does all day, you know? So, um, you know, it's just so, so much different to have, um, someone so, laid back and you can talk about your company with and they have input and they're so organized like i gave her a powerpoint and she made it look amazing and i was like what you know um which i'd always have to contract out because i was horrible at powerpoints or you know so it was just like i don't know we just compliment each other so well that's awesome Um, yeah it's it's tough i would say it's tough because like i see Like, me and my ex are very amicable. Like, there was a time, you know, when you go through, like, the first four or five months when you start to divide up financials, you lawyers and all this to where it was not good. But for our kids, even during the worst times, we were always amicable about the kids. Now, would we want to see each other? No. Yeah. But, like, now it's totally fine. Like, my kid had a volleyball game the other day. Me and my girlfriend show up her and her boyfriend are there. We're totally fine. I shake his hand. You know, she greets my girlfriend. She really has always told me she really likes my girlfriend. My kids love her. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah. I mean, and you know, it's, I'm not going to lie. Like it's extremely difficult to see another guy around your little girls. Yeah. Like, yeah, let's just say it's yes. And I don't know. I'll ever be comfortable with that, but well, I'll never be comfortable with that. But so yeah, but I mean, as far as the freedom goes and the change of life, you know, and just somebody who's who's knows nothing about this industry, I took her to Affiliate Summit in Affiliate Summit East. And, you know, I mean, the people that want to take pictures with me and all this other stuff. And, you know, it was it was an experience for her, okay. you know. So, you know, and we got to meet Ludacris and, you know, do all that cool stuff. And, and I told her, I'm like, watch, I can leave my wallet in my room. <laughs> Because everyone buys me drinks, everyone pays for this, you know, that everyone just wants to take me to dinner, you know, all this stuff. And so it was it was kind of funny, but it's true. Like, I don't think I spent a dollar there, Um, you know, so I I actually did buy a bottle, which was a mistake because it was at a really crappy event that. So I blew like 600 bucks on a bottle of something. And I think we drank like a quarter of it and then gave it to the table next to us and bailed. But whatever so anyway that was an experience but as far as just your question like the freedom and the the not being tied down and you know like like i said i love this chick um she lives a bit away she lives like about an hour away but like tonight you know and she's got two kids too okay so um it's tough sometimes you know um i struggled a bit with like the long-term aspect of it of like okay you can't move here i can't move there fuck 
Yeah. You know, what are we doing? Is this so we almost broke up and it was totally me like like just and I was like, wait, what am I doing? Like, you know, and I really realized like I love this chick. Like and I actually felt feelings more than I actually I ever felt for my ex wife. And um yeah, it was it was just um it's it's just been really enlightening, I should say. And the freedom part of it is is awesome. Like I can drink a beer at night if I want. And that's something that was not allowed oh, before. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just, there's a lot yeah. of things, you know, and I mean, physicians have, and I'm not talking about her, nope. right? I'm Definitely. not breaking any things, but they have God complexes, especially when they're the ones that are actually playing God and pulling the plug, you know, when people say, yeah, the pull the plug time. So they're the ones they administer the, the drugs that do kill people. And so, I mean, you have a, you're a little bit different, yeah. right? So, and you, you can be a little bit cold as to something. So yeah, it's just, like I said, you can, you, once you come comfortable with like yourself and your own independence of like, I could be alone for the rest of my life and that's okay. Yeah. Where at first, at first for the first like, four months or so I just I was terrified of that like I really was like oh my god I don't want to be alone for the rest of my life blah blah blah, blah. stuck and, in my own head kind of thing no yeah I I, yeah. I, know, I know what you mean yeah for sure and so you know and and um it was just it was just uh once you kind of validate that there's like I said there's there are women and you know it was tough to like you know say like hey i'm not really looking for anything long term you know like when when you see all that available and i don't and that sounds like a total dick but um it is what it is you know and i think it's for women too and guys whatever i mean i think i think everyone knows what i'm talking about that's been through that i think um but you know and then it's like okay you know what i can i'm okay and i, I can be independent and i'm totally fine but you know, like also like we had, um, nannies at our, you know, and we had, I mean, I hadn't done dishes or laundry in 15 years, hmm. um, or paid a bill like, you know, yeah. like, so actually like, this is going to sound so silly, but just like learning how to live on my own with just dry cleaning and yeah. fucking stamps. Like, <laughs> It sounds so silly, but I'm like, what the fuck? Stamps are so expensive. Like, like not really expensive, but I'm yeah, like, yeah. are you kidding me? But just like, I mean, this is hilarious, but just paying my electric bill, I was like, oh, fuck, you know? And now I'm off her insurance. So, and now it's like, it's a bitch to get insurance. Like, a bitch. Especially to get as you get older, right? Like, I'm sure it, 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 as you get older, it just gets harder and harder. Well, I mean, like, the thing, because I had coverage yeah. and... You know, I mean, I'm in great physical condition. I have no nothing. You know, I don't smoke. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm addicted to nicotine gum, but other than that, um, you know. So I mean, like, you know, that's like I went to the healthcare.gov and there was like one available that nobody takes. So I was like, okay, thanks, Obama. Um, and and it's like I don't even know what to do now, like because. Blue Cross Blue Shield doesn't offer individual plans. Aetna doesn't offer individual plans. And they're the two that are accepted everywhere. So I don't know. Like I almost feel like I'm going to self-insure okay. and get a, get a catastrophic plan, which is like anything over 100000 But just so, having to think about all of this again. Like your, your story to me is so interesting because it's like it's I, – you know, I, I'm – Everyone in, in the affiliate game that I've met is a, they're, they're a lot about personal growth and personal growth being a really important thing. And I think that's the new paradigm, I think, for people in general. Like our parents and our grandparents, they like they had their kids, they had their grandkids and they, you know, shuffled. You know, they're, they're, there's the, the, the paradigm wasn't as much about personal growth. And for you to have, you know, had this big trajectory in your career where you tried on being a CEO because you thought for a while, OK, that's what I should do. That's what I should want. You, you know, And like. At, you know the the marriage. You know, even though it may like I, I'm I don't know this for sure, but maybe it didn't feel right for a while. Maybe you knew deep down that, that it didn't feel right for a long time, but you you, you kind of went through the motions, and then to, and then to have yourself stripped down to to literally the nut house, and then to now to be piecing things back piece by piece in probably in a more conscious way at this point in your life. You're probably a lot more careful and conscious about about what you add to your life, sort of at this point, and it's uh it's it's interesting and inspiring. Yeah, it's crazy because I – it's funny because I'm, I'm the poorest rich person you'll ever meet. And I mean I've got you know obviously millions 
um, between brokerage and 401k and actually, you know, like in my checking, I've got over half a million dollars, you know, and, um, in my checking account and my banker is like, you realize like we only protect so much. And I'm like, yeah, but if you go under, then we've got worse problems, you know? So, so, you know, like, I mean, I actually set a budget, you know, like it is, is weird. Like I said, I'm the poorest rich person you've ever met. Most rich people are, most rich people are very conscious of how they spend their money, right? Like it's not about, and it's not about the money you make. It's about the money you keep as, as some wise people have told me. Right. And it's, it's like the problem is, is not losing it. You know, like, yeah. like, I mean, I want to pull completely out of the market. Um, I just, uh, I don't you're like pessimistic it. Because you think, you think this is the calm before the storm as, as a, a man once said in the news recently, you think, you think we're headed to some crazy times? Well, I, I don't understand it. I mean, I, I like, I don't like to put my money into other people's hands and say, Hey, you know, um, yeah, I don't like it. I don't, I feel as weird as it sounds. Like I, I would rather buy like bullets and gold. Me and one of my friends who's made, a, he's made a lot more money than me on the internet. Um, he, we always joke because he's like, you know, bullets and gold, bullets and gold, and because those are things that will always have value. And it's not really an investment to make money with. It's more that you'll have something of value no matter what happens. Yeah. So. I mean, do I feel the market's going to crash? I don't know. I mean, no I would feel knows. the same. I would feel the same way if it was wherever it was at. I mean, I just I feel insecure about having you know the, all this cash in. Now there was some things I realized, like there was like one account that I put like eight thousand dollars in that's now has over ninety. You know, like there's some things like I'm like, oh, you know. But I think if I really were to study it and understand it i would feel good about it you know but i don't i don't know anything i'm just all all i know is i'm putting money into a guy's hands and paying him to know in a way yeah and he gets yeah and i've i've just like the one thing is i found a guy who's really good and i'm probably actually one of the lower net worth people in his thing but he loves me because i'm not you know i'm well i'm he likes my story you know and, and shit like that too so I mean, I've made him show me his portfolio, you know, and what are you doing and what do you, what are you going to do when it crashes, you know, cause I want to do exactly what you do. Yeah. And I still don't feel very, like I said, I just don't feel safe in the market. I'd rather, I honestly would rather in Lincoln, they've got municipal bonds that pay 4%. Like I almost feel like Kate's backed by the government. Like, yeah. And you're investing in your your neighborhood, your your community as well in that in that mm-hmm. sense too. So it's so it's probably pretty good. Do you fuck with crypto at all? No, that's another one that you, that in order to invest in it, you'd want to fully understand it. And who fully understands crypto at this point? Right. Well, the the interesting thing is I I mined bitcoins for fun. You know, back in the day. Yeah. And I don't I don't think people understand like bitcoins and how there's a limit to them. And I think we hit the hard limit. No, not, not yet. No, we haven't hit okay. the limit yet. They're, but they right. hit five thousand today. They hit. They hit five thousand dollars. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I sold them for ninety bucks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I thought that was doing very well. So, but it's one of those things know. that's mm-hmm. going to go until it doesn't. Until the banks decide, okay, here's the new here's the new currency, cryptocurrency with all the backdoors that it needs or whatever. Uh, right. And then and then it could be zero. So it's it's such an interesting market. I'm, I'm dabbling a little bit in it, uh, it with with a few people that I'm like that I really trust. I'm doing the same thing. Like I, I can't keep up with with an, enough to be confident in what I'm investing in necessarily. But there are some people that I know that are so immersed in it. Um, I'm taking some advice from them. So so that's pretty. See, I, I would much rather invest in startups. Yeah. To where I could I I mean, I would be a. I don't want to say a big reason, but I do into, I mean, that have really amazing products, but there's so many really amazing products that never see the light of day because the founders are bagging groceries, you know, and they just, they're good programmers and stuff, but I'm going to lunch with a kid tomorrow and, you know, and it's like some of it, you know, like you see, and it's just, it may, like there's one right now that I love and but the kid wants like 250 grand and he wants to get an office and he's, he's already outlined. He needs these chairs and this and this. And I'm like, you're fucking insane. Like I'll give you 10 grand and you get to this point yeah. and then I'll give you more money. Like, 
there's no way I'm giving you a bunch of cash. I mean, I'll put it in a trust, you know, or something like that that shows I'm in, you know, but you need to hit benchmarks, you know, but I don't know. He, uh, I don't know. Anyway, so there's, there's this, yeah, there's, there's in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, there's a lot of tax advantages to angel investing. Um, if you just Google like Nebraska angel tax credit, you'll see you get 40% back on your money from the state. So if you invest a million bucks, you get 400,000 back and that 400,000 is tax free. So like really what do you have at risk at the end of the day? I mean, you're, it's 40% off, you know, to, to make an investment. Um, so, uh, I think the minimum is like 60 grand or something like that. So, you know, you invest 60, you get 40% of that back and you know, how much do you really have at risk? So especially when it's a company that you see, if I mailed my list, this product, I would get that back in two months. You know what I mean? Like if I had sizable equity, which I, I would have to, I'd, ha- I'd, I'd almost have to be like the profit, but on the, and actually, I don't know if, you know, like we did that below deck show with yeah. me and John Chow and yeah, stuff. That's so interesting. we've actually, like, I've actually had a couple conversations with 51 minds, who is the company that like you deal with. Um, and I've talked to them about a reality show where I take my team and we go into a company and it's called double or nothing. And it's basically like we double their revenue within 90 days and, or it costs them nothing to do it. But if we do, then we get 20% equity in their company. Um, that was like, just like the original pitch to them. And they love, they really like it a lot. I don't know if I would actually do it. Um, you would do big brother though, right? I have been trying. I already put in my application for next like year. Like four times. So, you've, this is your fifth or sixth time you've applied. Why aren't oh, you? Oh, I've put it in since Big Brother 11. So this will be my ninth year trying. So, um, yeah, I don't know. You know, I've I got to I got to know um, some casting people after the the Bravo thing, and they've asked me and John Chow to come back like several times because okay. we, we doubled their ratings. I mean, when we were on it, That's like huge. the episodes we were on, um, we doubled they, that, the one, the original one, we pulled like almost 2 million viewers, which was way more than the vice presidential debate that night, which was on NBC, you know? So it was like third of all of television that night. So, you know, the Bravo people are like, yeah, people are loving the storyline. And I'm just like, eh, yeah, we met, we emailed 5 million people. And, you know, I mean, like, can we, you know, like, of course we're going to get more. Um, so, but yeah, so they love the idea of the show. Um, I went to, when I was in New York city for affiliates in the East, I met with some of the executives and they, wanted to know more details and how I saw. And I said, you know, I don't really like that was just my initial. And they were like, you know, the success of the profit and all this stuff. Like, so like a lot of people don't understand how reality TV works, but basically a company like 51 minds or others like survivor or anything, they actually will do the show and, and then they'll sell it to a network. Okay. okay. So like, that's why you see like Mark Burnett things like all over the place. Yeah. Right. Cause, cause he'll do a show and film, you know, the, a season of it and then they'll shop it to networks and you know, that's how it works. So 51 minds is the company that did like below deck and then somebody did the Kardashians and somebody did this and then they sold it to, you know, the, the buyer. So that's how that works. Huh. Um, very interesting. So for instance, so for instance, like just because they're tied to Bravo on this show does not mean that if we did this double or nothing thing, they would probably go to like CNBC or, you know, something like that who've had success with shows similar. Um, so anyway, it's just that, that world. But then it also introduced me to like casting and I got to, um, because 51 minds is Canadian. They, um, introed me to like one of the high level casting people at, um, uh, for big brother Canada. And they kind of told me about how it works and they were like, you know, here's how it is. Like CBS gives us, you know, the roles they want filled. Like they want, you know, this many black people, this many, you know, this thing, this thing, this thing, hot chicks. Yeah. This, you know, this kind of role, um, you know, and they want to, tra- you know, like a transgender person, if they can get one, they want this and they want this. And they're like, we only have about three, positions you know to be filled and 
you know, like unless they're looking for a 40 some year old internet marketer, self-made millionaire, you know, they're probably, and I'm like, yeah, but I'm like, that's a you good know, character. I, I'd watch that. I told, I told them, I'm like, look, here's the deal is that I've got like, what I do for a living is convince people to buy stuff that they wouldn't normally. That's the definition of marketing. And I'm like, so I'm like, you know, for me in the house, I would get all these people to do what I'm like, how, how not is that an egotistical pitch, you know, to get on the show? You'd be like but, the, the Lex Luthor mastermind. And, and I'm, I, I know. I, I don't, we're running out of time here. I did want to ask you what your general strategy would be for Big Brother because I know you've been plotting it out for many years now. I guess it would be dependent I, on the exact cast that you pull at that given time. Yeah, I mean like the you just have to like come off like really – Honestly, like, like this is going to be no thing. Like I do this for a living. Like these people are in for it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and then kind of like, you know, you're a divorced father of two, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you've got the green light to have a showman, you know, like you just have to like really, you know, kind of play it up a lot. Nice. So, well, I wish you the best in that. I do hope, I hope I would like to see you on big brother one day. I also, uh, Jordan uh, Rosenberg asked me to say, why are you, when are you going to come to Affiliate World? When are you going to come to Affiliate World Asia? Is, is Bangkok too far to fly? You know, I've never been overseas. Like, oh, okay. I've never been – I mean, you know, there's there's little things, you know, like Mexico and, you know, other, other things. You know, obviously the British Virgin Islands. So I can say I've been to Europe maybe now. Um, but no, I just never have. I mean, it's not too far to go. I mean, it's just the – it's not – I mean I totally would. It's just a matter of logistics yeah. and you Maybe. know, especially with my kids and yeah. figuring that out and yeah. So totally. it's just it's just a matter of, of that kind of stuff. So nice. – and especially now with my new company, like we're in such of a stage of you know, my developers. Like right before this, I asked you like you know, do I need – is this video because I'll put a shirt on? And that's because like I just woke up about two hours ago and that's because my developers – are in Romania and Latvia. Yeah. And so like for them, I work from um, like 4 a.m. my time until 10 a.m. And then most days I'll, when I don't have my kids and I'll sleep, you know, well, even when I have my kids, you know, um, I run them to school and around and stuff. But then like, you know, during the school day, sometimes I'll get in a nap and there's not always days I work with my developers. But yeah, so my days are, are interesting and like with this new application, um, you know, it's all about testing and growth and people sign up and they're spam like, checker, well, right? For the audience. Yeah. To, to yeah. Check it out, spam checker. Yeah. So no R just spam checker. And you know, like right now, like it's, it's a lot of small things, you know, like we haven't been doing it for that long. So it's a matter of things like, Oh yeah, I should, you know, people will bitch about stuff and I'll just give them a free account. You know, I'm like, Hey, that's a good point. Here's a free account, you know? And then I'll, I'll be like, oh, I didn't think of that, you know? And there's just, there's just a lot with interface and tools and you find out what people care about, what they don't care about, how to position it, you know, and then you take your old strategies of, you know, funnels and, this kind of stuff. So, I mean, doing an application like this, you know, I don't need to raise money, you know, even though I thought about raising money from strategic people mm -hmm. who would be like, like, let's say, uh, I don't want to throw out any of the people that want to do it. Um, but let's say like a Frank Kern. Yeah. Neil. Patel, okay. So right. Frank. Kern. Yeah, actually, actually Neil's one of the, <laughs> I, I kind of assumed that. Um, but like Frank Kern, like, like those, the people who would be strategic, you know, in that I would give them a much better valuation because of their following and what they can do and what they can help with. Um, you know, and then like there's, there's other people, there would be strategic people yeah. who I wouldn't ask for much money. Um, cause I mean, like, I mean, I'm talking like, I don't know, a small, not a very large amount, like, because like. For this to get to, I'm in this for the long game, so I'm. It's cash flowing, which is great. Yeah. Um, but I would rather it grow than I don't care about making money as long as the growth is there. Okay. Um, because the more the growth is there, then the more you know it's going to work. Mm -hmm. And you know, and so and you can tweak right the dials now, when you get the momentum, right? When you have the full momentum, right. it's the profitability can come. Yeah, and I have I mean I have so many people that want to promote it and I'm just like, you know what? Let me get let me get my conversion better. Let me get this stuff better. And so, you know, and then I I buy traffic to it from Facebook, you know, and then 
you know, it's so, you know, it's kind of a loss leader to me right now, but I need, you have to have traffic, you know, mm-hmm. to, to, and you need to have the same source of traffic. So, you know, spending, I don't spend a lot, like 500 bucks a day, you know, well, I guess that probably is a lot to Fair a lot enough. of people. Yeah. Um, you know, but, but just to get that much, it doesn't, you know, it just yields sometimes click costs you two bucks, you know, yeah. so that's 250 people that didn't really help a lot, but over time, you know, you get your conversion down, you figure out how much of your funnels is making a difference versus just like, do I right now, like you give me your name and email when you go there and then you see the price, there's price nowhere else on the thing. It's like create my, start my trial. And then, you know, cause it's important to capture an email so then you can funnel them in and get them to sign up. But what I'm finding now and testing is like just sending people to the checkout page is working better. Huh. So, yeah. That's really interesting. And then, and then we'll probably throw an exit intent so that we can do semi the same thing. So, nice. and I'm probably going to rebrand. So people that watch this later is going to be, I'm thinking email wise. Okay. Um, cause I bought the dot com and I like it because it's like smart email stuff because we're into like the thing is we've grown so much more than spam. Like originally it was just like, did your email go to spam? Okay. Yes, it did. Now why did it? And then we dissect it until we can tell you exactly what's causing it to go to email. And we also do it from your provider. So if you use a Weber, then we use our a Weber account to keep sending until it goes through. So there's no false positives. And that's something like, I mean, there's very few people that do anything, but, but, the ones that do, they send it from their server or whatever. That's whatever. So, um, but then we got way more into the insights of like, like, okay, like let's say you're sending out an, an email to make sales and it's going into updates or social or whatever, but you want it to go to this tab. Well, we do the same thing we do with testing for spam. Like you want to do it for promotions. Well, we'll keep doing it until it's like, okay, this is what's causing it to go to social, mm-hmm. which is, you know, the graveyard. So anyway, so, that's super interesting. Yeah. Um, what we can talk, we should talk about this at some other point, but what does a blast to the shoe money list look like? What is it like? How, how is your, your list these days? And and are you still doing like active JV promotion to it? It depends on the JV person. I mean, like, unless I've met the person in person, um, I'm hesitant to do stuff. I mean, I have to be careful, you know, with what I promote because I always tell people like, look, if you have problems giving a refund, like I will refund you. And there's been like one or two that I've, I've had to do that with. Um, but like if it's a current or it's something with a really good quality product and that, you know, the, I've never had anyone have a problem with refunds with no problem. Um, I mean, I, I would suggest people go to John Chow cause he'll promote the opening of a dairy queen, you know? So <laughs> nice. So yeah. Okay. Well, we okay. should talk because we have met in person, as you may recall, in Las Vegas, and we have a, okay. a Facebook masterclass. So on that okay. note, I, we've gone a little bit over here, but thank you so much for this chat today. It was super candid, no super problem. interesting. Uh, people want to check you out. First of all, check out spamchecka.com, soon to be maybe email-wise. Uh, and, yep. and if they want to uh, they want to follow your blog, which is shoemoney.com. Yep. Uh, and anything else that you active and And fo- if you can, just follow him on Facebook because he's got he, – Yeah, he's, yeah, yeah Facebook is right the best. There. Yeah. You're you're pretty pretty loose with yeah, your, face- your commentary there. I enjoy it. It's facebook.com slash anesthesiologist. Sorry. <laughs> Just one last thing. Did you keep the car? I need to know also what happened to the to the No, vet. I sold it. You had to sell the vet on I sold it. Sold it on yeah, and the Yeah. And the guy that bought it is actually like, hey, he's like nitpicking shit. He's like, it shakes when you go over sixty. And I'm like, dude, I haven't driven it over sixty for three months. Can you go have the alignment checked? I don't Yeah, I don't it's know. It's not my problem anymore. <laughs> yeah. I mean yeah, I mean, like, oh, I want to make sure things are right with them, you know, yeah. but at the same time, it's like, dude, don't nitpick, you know, so whatever. Okay. All right, man. Well, thanks. Thanks, man. Thanks, Jeremy. All Talk right. to you later. All right, later. Bye.